Hello, and welcome to Kroll Security Concepts Podcast, the podcast where Kroll security experts discuss the more prevalent topics in today's risk environment. On today's episode, I'm bringing in colleagues from two of Kroll's EMEA offices to discuss the great successes they've seen in deploying a multifaceted investigation methodology in which they bring entities across Kroll's practice areas to bear in their large scale investigations of an incident. Our guests today are Marco de Barnardine, Francesca Castelli, and Nick Doyle. Marco and Francesca are both from our Milan, Italy office and are integral team members in the investigation practice for that region. Marco is Kroll's Italy country manager and has a focus on Italy, Malta, Austria, Greece, and the wider Mediterranean area. Over the years, Marco has led multiple investigations into leaks of information relating to intellectual property, working with clients and their legal advisors on civil litigation cases, requiring a combination of computer forensics, interviews, analysis of public domain materials, and intelligence gathering. Francesca is a senior manager in Kroll's business intelligence and investigations practice and is a certified fraud investigator. Francesca has led investigations for clients into allegation of fraud, corruption, conflict of interest, and leaks of information by combining different and complementary investigative techniques like those that we will be discussing today. Nick leads our security risk management practice in EMEA and works collaboratively with our investigation teams across the region to include deploying resources to the Milan office to assist in some high-profile investigations in that market with great success. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks, uh, Jeff, and it's great to be on this podcast with my colleagues from the Milan office, Francesca and Marco. Uh, We've worked very much collaboratively with them in the past year and actually for longer than that. And it's great to have them on this podcast to to talk about investigations and security. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, indeed, it's a pleasure. And indeed, I think we we work very well together so far. I think it's very useful to have also this kind of conversation today uh, to share our thoughts and to try to start the really uh, interesting things again together. Uh, Hey, Jeff. Hi, Nick. Many thanks for having us on, on, on this initiative. And um, as my colleague said before me, I'm very happy to be here and uh, looking forward to an interesting conversation. Excellent. I'm, I'm uh, actually really looking forward to this one because I find it kind of fascinating when we can have these multifaceted investigations that bring in everybody from cyber to physical security to BINI, the investigation side, to it, the end result that is a fantastic investigation that finds all their issues, fixes those issues, and tells them what happened and how this all worked out. Uh, so I really uh, am excited about this topic. I think what we'll probably do for the format of this podcast is to look at the life cycle of the investigation. Start with the very beginning, the incident that sets off the need for an investigation, and work it through the whole way that you guys typically approach these investigations and bring everybody in when needed. So let's go ahead and uh, get started with a little bit of conversation on you know that that triggering point and how you determine what is going to be needed to do this investigation successfully. If I may jump in, I'll say, uh, yeah, I think that the, the real thing is that when an incident or a traumatic event occurs, it is when also, let's say, at a very high level at the company, the board level even, or the stakeholders understand that there's something wrong and they need to react. At that stage, we are normally engaged in a very, let's say, with the, with the union say to do something because there is something that, that went wrong and we need to act very promptly and very quickly, I would say. And there is a set of investigative techniques and methodologies we need to deploy quickly with the, with the right expertise and the right order, let's say, um, to determine a series of uh, very important issues like the circle of knowledge, what happened, what really, let's say, what was, what was wrong in terms of uh, if something has been leaked or um, a theft of, of physical goods occurred, or if we are talking about a cyber incident. So depending on really the nature of the case, the methodologies and the people to be deployed really vary. Yeah, so all the practice areas come together and kind of look at what this case is, what the incident is, and determine which practice areas really need to be involved. I know a lot of these cases do involve you guys going in and doing the expertise in the investigations, doing the interviews, do all of those kind of things, while at the same time, we on the security side are in there to see what was actually exploited 
what vulnerabilities were there that we could exploit to get this package removed from your property or intellectual property removed from your servers if it's a cyber side, those kind of things. And that's how it all plays together so well. So when we're kicking these investigations off, how is it typically in your experience in the market there when you're working out of Italy and you're bringing in different parts of the Kroll company, how are you typically laying out your investigations to make this all get kicked off and get started? Well, there is always a first phase and the, the, the first phase, the key element of the first phase is fully understand and receiving a full debrief from the client. We regard what really happened or at least what is the understanding of the client on what happened. Uh, this is key for us to understand and start to wrap our heads around uh, the expertise that we may be requiring to conduct the investigation. As you, as you and Francesca correctly say earlier, there can be many moving parts and different expertise may be required. So the the, the, debrief, the brief, first brief that we receive is key. After that, uh, from an investigative point of view, uh, there are two to three things that are key. The first one is trying to secure whatever evidence that is maybe available to us. And as Francesca was saying earlier, the timing is a key factor here because we may need to uh, extract um, from, from computers, to extract from uh, emails. Uh, we may need to uh, identify people quickly enough to understand if um, any evidence may be uh, under risk of being destroyed, etc. So again, this exercise of mapping exactly which document we have, which evidence we may need to secure, uh, it's quite a key element. And aside that, um, another basic element I would say is to try again to find the right to staffing the team, uh, meaning to find the right people that can do the job for you. So in the terms of investigation, finding the right analysts that can analyze, for instance, going through the, the emails, uh, understanding the copper records if I required, going through documents if it's required, but also people who can conduct interviews with potential witnesses as well. Excellent. Yeah, so obviously we we perform our best services when we have this multifaceted approach that we can come at every angle for an investigation. So Nick, when you get brought in on these, I know I do this quite often on, on our parts here in the States, but when you get brought in, what are, what are your key elements that you want to make sure are covered when you're brought into an investigation, some sort of a loss by, uh, you know, the BINI team, the investigators? Well, firstly, I think, you know, investigations practice is a, a natural partner to our security risk management practice. Our security specialists can provide a really nuanced analysis of the operational risks and the potential requirements uh, needed to mitigate physical risk as part of an investigative process. So we'll look at the protection of people, we'll look at the protection of assets, and collectively, both the investigation team and the security team uh, provide a complete picture of both the business risk environment and the physical risk environment. And that's very important when we're looking at, say, loss prevention uh, projects, which we've worked on together uh, in Italy and in other locations across Europe as well in the past year. Uh, when discussing this uh, this podcast with Francesca, uh, we, we thought about that that there is uh, a sort a sort of circle that um, of interaction between the investigation uh, the investigative angle and the security angle, whereas the investigation serves as a roadmap of understanding the organization, try to understand what went wrong, and then the security uh, practice with this roadmap is in the position where they can actually read the organization and then try to identify the gaps. I don't know, Francesca, you were discussing about that. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that, that in, at the end of the story, the incident becomes really, let's say, the trigger to, to understand that more broadly something needs to be fixed in the sense that the incident guides and uh, allows also the company to become aware that they need to rethink about something and to involve the right people and having the availability of people at different levels to cooperate all together. And so during the investigation, we bring together our colleagues from different divisions, in particular Nick and his team, to, to try to, uh, to, to understand really if something went wrong and the incident occurred, where the vulnerabilities were that were exploited in terms of, let's say, physical vulnerabilities, but also in terms of policies, in terms of procedures, in terms of the overall assessment. And it is something that um, it's really, in a way, as I said, incident can just be 
uh, as a sort of first step of um, rethinking about the organization. And I think as a consequence of our participation on these investigations as well, it's also you know, right to say that it's of added benefit to a client because as well as supporting our investigators, we're also able to provide inputs and suggestions and recommendations uh, to our clients to, to mitigate the chance of any of these potential incidents or thefts, whatever, from happening again by you know, securing their security environment moving forward. So we can, we, can, we can enable the client to do that. We can assist the client to do that. So it's almost like a follow-on service. We've done the investigation. We've understood what happened. And then we can start to develop a, a, a more secure uh, environment for the client to operate in, you know, moving forward so they don't have these issues again. Yeah, I, I like how that we bring in all of the different experts so that we're giving a complete picture to the client. We're telling them what happened, but we're also telling them how to fix those vulnerabilities that were exploited. Um, that's something that, you know, a lot of investigations would be best suited for, uh, whether it be a loss of intellectual property off of a server or, you know, someone walking out with this product that you're going to be releasing in two weeks and no one on the outside should have been able to see and showing it up on the internet and everybody understands what's coming in a couple of weeks. Uh, we see that quite often. I mean, I just did a case where we, we had essentially a lot of offices that are almost vacant all over the country here because people aren't working in the offices and someone was able to wander into an office and walk away with several laptops that may have had pertinent uh, data on them. So we actually went through the investigative, went through and did all the interviews, did all of the things that you guys typically do when you're building your cases. At the same time, I was there to look at how this happened, how this person got into the building, how they got around security, how they got around your security technology, how they actually were in the space without really leaving a lot of evidence that they were there that we could use. Uh, so I, th I find all of this work kind of fascinating because it you kind of do that that sleuthing and uh, work together with the team and put together a complete package that proves to be very beneficial to the client. Uh, when we're talking about the, the methodology of how you typically would do your investigation, how it all fits in, you know, what are the what are the key elements of your investigation and how security may play a part or how cybersecurity may play a part? You know, when you're doing these investigations, historically, where do we really see the breakout of, of the types of work that are happening? Well, I, I will give it a first stab. It's a, it depends because uh, sometimes it happened that we start first the investigation and then once we conclude the investigation, we make sure the client understands that, he, that the investigation will not provide a full solution for his issues. And then we advise the client to bring in a security management expertise into the equation. In that kind of situation, the role of the investigate of, of my team would be more of supporting by feeding the information we have developed during our investigation into Nick and his team, so they are able to fully understand and then make their own recommendation after they're conducting their part of work. Other cases, uh, they see a combined and a joint effort uh, effort of the investigation that takes place at the same time of the of the assessment. But again, as I was saying before. I think that the benefits of conducting potentially the investigation at an earlier stage is the, to provide the roadmap for then the exercise and the security assessment that, com that will follow afterwards. I'd also like to add that when you look into this at the beginning altogether, it means that uh, since the, the very first step of the investigation, for example, in conducting the interviews, um, you know, you are talking to people and sometimes they are very sensitive to the issues that are under discussion because they might be, let's say, part of the investigation uh, even the, if there is any internal complicity so doing an interview in which any of us can uh, let's say make his or her own questions in a way that suited the specific situation and gather all the information together um, it, it's very key and also for example uh, we, we, we made a case in which uh, a, let's say a key part was an on-site visit because there was a, 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 a theft of physical goods and so being together there um, meant that 
each of us uh, was looking at different things uh, because each of us has its own, let's say, background and also aim and purpose for the client. But when we then uh, came back all together, bringing what we have learned about this on-site visit, we realized that, let's say, the picture that came out from our joint efforts were really much better than uh, if we were there one, let's say, uh, alone. And also, in, 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 in this sense, it, it, it makes a very, let's say, big importance that when we are together, we also convey uh, the, a different, let's say, image of, of our job and our uh, of the value we can add to the client because um, we are able to cover all the analytic approach, for example, regarding, let's say, security in a way that the client is not just asking for what happened in this specific theft were some criminal gangs involved? Is there an internal path? There is internal complicity more broadly about what was really vulnerable, what was really vulnerable in this situation, and what you could do to prevent this kind of event take place another time in the future. I, I think that's very relevant as well. Um, you know, security risk management has a, a depth of experience in, in in operating security controls and. Uh, you know, especially in real life or uh, real world situations. And I think our knowledge of security systems uh, can influence the finding of an investigation. So, you know, because, because of our, uh, because of this knowledge, we, we can look at the, the methodology of, say, how a theft occurred. And we, we can look at how that theft was captured or wasn't captured. And, um, you know, that, that can influence uh, the findings of the investigation. It can also eliminate potentially inside the threats because of that input as well. So it can bear a real, real quality, quality influence on an investigation. That makes sense. Uh, when you guys are doing these investigations, who are you typically working with? Are you working directly with the board of the company? Or are you working with local personnel? How does that usually play out when we come in? I know on our physical security side, we're working with local people looking at doors and cameras and things along those lines, operational procedures. How is it really working on the investigative side? Who do you talk to? Who are you working with? It's, it's a key question, Jeff, because uh, we, have, um, we have an experience that tells us that it's key to involve uh, C-level people and even the board at the very early stage in the sense that having a clear idea of what is the objective of our engagement. Not only resolve and, let's say, ask a question regarding the specific theft, as I said, the specific incident, but more broadly, um, let's say, doing our investigation in a way that is not just a cost, but an investment, as we were discussing with Marco several times regarding this type of assignment. So, of course, we, we, we talk and we deal with people at various levels during the, let's say, day-to-day -day investigation. We talk to people that might have uh, useful information for us. We go to the security manager. We talk to, let's say, people in the warehouse if a physical theft occurs. We, we talk to the uh, chief information officer or to people that might have access to the information that was stolen, depending on the different um, type of incident that occurred. But uh, at the end of the story, let's say, the, say uh, the, the people to whom we are talking at the end of our investigation, when we have to provide our results and provide our recommendation, are really, I would say, people that are the ones who need to decide the risk that the organization wants to take and the risk appetite. Because it's impossible to protect everything uh, 100%. So we need to decide where the risk is acceptable and if it is not, how much you want really to invest in order to secure the organization. And it is a typically decision that must uh, be taken at a very high level of the organization. I, I would add when it comes to uh, talking to people and especially interviewing uh, potential witnesses, there are a couple of considerations also to take into, into account here. Um, in the process of conducting an investigation, um, the client would like normally, usually to push for you to talk to certain people and maybe avoid to talk to certain other people. And I think it's key for the investigator who is deployed on the field to be able to make that call. Uh, whereas if he thinks that talking to someone 
is very key and very important. It will have to push it a little bit with the client in order to have access to that information, specific information he's looking for. And I'm thinking, especially in cases of a leak of information where, especially with sensitive information, the client may be a little bit uh, reticent in terms of giving you access to the to the all the layers of your organization of his organization. So what what is required for the investigator is to kind of a little bit of diplomacy uh, with the client uh, in order to have the right accesses. And and that's also uh, key because you need to develop that kind of diplomacy. For, for, for the reason that Francesca was also explaining, when you have to deliver your message to the board, which is the board that has to receive the message because he can take the decision, but also you have to be able to, to rely your findings to the board. And then sometimes you have to deliver bad news. Um, and so working out that diplomatic approach is the one that allows you to have that credibility to also to be able to deliver that kind of news to the client, but also to make the client willing to listen to your advice when it comes to remediation and mitigation. Yeah, I can certainly see that, you know, your end result, if you have enough information and it's coming from several different entities about how this is actually going to work, how you're going to deploy your protective countermeasures or whatever it may be to respond to this last incident, I could see where the board would want to see that in a complete package so that they understand that they are not just getting, you know, the information about what happened on this event. They are getting something that's going to prepare them for events two, three, and four down the road so that they're actually able to have a feasible plan that they can deploy based on their risk appetite to protect themselves against any future incursions. Uh, when it comes to the actual investigations that you guys are doing. I know we have to be very uh, generic because we have a lot of confidentiality involved, but is there any trends that you're seeing? Is it loss of IP? Is it loss of product? I mean, are you guys seeing any trends today of what your investigations look like? The, the way the Italian market is, is structured uh, is composed by few large companies, a large corporation, but there is a plethora of smaller uh, companies, uh, all of them, the small, medium-sized companies, all of them, they have something very specific and valuable, which is intellectual property, which is like trade secrets, etc. So the trend is try to help those companies to put to secure their intellectual property, making sure that they can retain the edge if they want to com to, to to keep on being competitive on the international markets. I see that there is not enough interest in the Italian companies because they tend to see security as a cost and not as an investment. There is there's not enough interest in in that in that area of expertise, and this is why I think the message is, yes, we can conduct investigation and can and help a company to to understand the narrative and the responsibilities. But yes, Italian companies definitely needs the security risk management approach that will help them to secure their companies and potentially avoid that traumatic event, avoid that trigger event, uh, in order that to 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 create a, a secure a security uh, around the company and what is important for you to protect. Makes sense. Okay, so I guess we're to the point now where we try to give our listeners a bit of advice. Uh, what what are those? key items, those food for thought pieces that you really want to make sure we express here that your clients and everybody out there really needs to be aware of when they have an incident and they need to start an investigation. I think if we're talking around um, insider threats and where there's a collaborative approach from the investigations team and the security risk management team uh, about uh, providing solutions to clients with, with insider threats. It's important to, to mention that many, many clients actually, uh, you know, have perimeters of security because they're protecting themselves against external threats. And where we can advise clients around internal threats is looking at the process, because these people are already inside the perimeter, where a lot of the security environment isn't as rigid as it would be around the perimeter of a site. So therefore we can work with our investigators along the process and controls of you know that carry on within an inter, you know internally within an organization to identify those vulnerabilities to identify those gaps for the investigators to look at as potential avenues of where the internal threats or the theft of ip have, have occurred yeah and if i can jump on this uh, on this 
last point that Nick just made is the in, in conducting, especially for the insider threat investigation, you do realize that the, the human element is key uh, because, of course, uh, either willingly, willingly or unwillingly, uh, a subject was responsible for you know, data leak or information loss or IP theft. And so one of the advice for companies is always to make sure and to understand what's the level of satisfaction of your workforce. Because these granted employees, uh, people do believe that uh, they're not treated fairly by the company. They're more um, subject to potentially either being victim of uh, um, third party who want to aggressively capture relevant information from within the organization, or they maybe they'd be tempted uh, in order to take revenge over the company uh, to try to you know take trade secrets, trade important and valuable information, and bring it out uh, just to prove the point that they can harm the company. So definitely, the human aspect is key in these kind of uh, issues. Excellent. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming on and, and enlightening us on how this multifaceted investigation uh, works and how it really benefits the client as an investment in their future protections. Thanks for having us here. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jeff. It's I been want to also thank the listeners for tuning in for this one. We hope to see you guys in a couple of weeks. Thanks a lot. Thank you.